Hi, I'm Stefania, and I am here with my lovely co-hosts, Sienna and Nikki. Hello. Hello. If you're new here, please make sure to subscribe to our channel and enable your notifications. Sit back, relax. Every reference we'll discuss today will be added to the description box below after the show. And as usual, we want the show to be interactive, so please use the chat to ask any questions, and we'll get to as many as the, of them as we can. All right, today's guest is Michaela Greiler. Michaela is a software engineer and a tech entrepreneur. She helps companies boost their code review practices through her training and consultancy company. She has a PhD from Delft University of Technology. She has 15 years of, experiencing, of experience analyzing and improving the software engineering process and developing tools. And she also hosts the Software Engineering Unlocked podcast. Welcome, Michaela. Hello, thank you for having me. I'm really, really excited and super thrilled to be here. We are so thrilled to have you. So what do you have prepared for us today? Well, I have a couple of things and um, I actually watched uh, the, the last shows about secure code reviews and, uh, you know, security audits and so on. And so I wanted to make this session also a little bit different today, um, show something new. And um, also wanted to um, show or give you um, a lot of input from my background, which is empirical software engineering. So this means that during my PhD studies, for example, and also during my work at Microsoft, I analyzed how people are doing code reviews, how are they understanding code, right? And so what we wanted to do is to get more understanding about software engineering practices. Are they good, are they bad, right? What should we do? What are some, you know, what are some uh, techniques, for example, for code comprehension that could help people understand code? And um, and especially for code reviews, right? So at Microsoft, for example, I worked with, with all major product teams, be it Office, uh, Windows, Visual Studio, and with the engineers to really understand are there code review techniques, right, that they're doing? Is this even helping us? How is it helping? What are some teams doing that it's really benefiting them? And what are some teams doing that they are struggling, right? And so I want to bring a lot of that perspective today, a data-driven perspective also, um, research perspective into that show, show you a little bit the background, what's behind code reviews. And then I also brought um, a, a, an example, an example code that we are going to review together, I hope, and uh, where we hopefully will see some of the aspects that I talked before about um, in, in real life, like in action. Great. We love new perspectives here. So we are very excited to have you. Yeah, really cool. So right. um, should we just deep dive in? And yeah, um, yeah okay, yeah. I was going <laughs> to ask, should I share your screen? I am going to share my screen. If I should uh, can do it, I will just um, share. Oh, stop share screen. Oh, it's already shared, right? Yes. Um, so, okay, then just let me get my slides up here and... Um, and I will, uh, I have to arrange, let me, let me give me one second that I arrange no all of you. I somehow for lost now you. <laughs> oh, here you are. So I'm putting you on my second monitor over here so that I still see you all. Um, but yeah, my slides I think are up. And um, so if you want me to start, I can do it. Let's do it. Very cool. So as I said, um, I have been researching code review practices for, for many, many years. And I've been working with a lot of teams. And so what I try to do um, in uh, since, since a couple of years is really helping engineering teams to make code reviews their superpower. And how does that work? Well, if we think about all the, the teams, all the companies that are investing in code reviews, and these are just a couple of uh, companies that I either have really good understanding of the code review practices, or I've worked really closely with them. And so, as we can see, there are, are large corporations, but there are even smaller um, companies, like two two people companies that are doing code review. So a lot of people are jumped onto this code review wagon, um, especially with the rise of tools such as GitHub, um, GitLab, Bitbucket, and so on, where you actually have code review practices right out of the box, right? And so maybe this is also a little bit what differentiates this talk today or this presentation today from the other. Um, views that you had on, on the show is that today I will focus on code reviews as they are part of uh, the daily 
engineering practices of developers. So it's not about sub subject matter experts, about security experts and how they are doing audits, for example, or you know, larger security uh, code reviews, but it's really how can um, developers use code reviews to find security in issues during development or even before they're starting to do code, right? And so, as I said, so many companies actually invest in code reviews or started to do code reviews. And when we asked at Microsoft, this was one study that we ran and um, over, over 900 engineers actually responded we asked them, why do you do it, right? What are the motivations for code reviews? And we saw that code improvements and finding defects, these are the top ranked um, reasons for people at Microsoft, for developers at Microsoft to do code reviews. And actually we asked this uh, over time, um, several times, and the, the ranking changed a little bit, but it was always code improvements or finding defects that are, you know, that were the first ones and very close to each other. But then there are so many other things that you can actually do in code reviews, right? So you can uh, you have increased knowledge transfer, uh, people are, are working with each other, collaboration, mentoring, learning, and so on, right? But they are ranked less high um, as a motivation for code reviews, right? And so if this is our, our motivation, one of the question is, are we actually getting that out of code reviews, right? And so there are actually studies that show that code reviews correlate with reduction of defects. Or um, another study, this is, for example, the sec second study that um, was done at Sony, that unreviewed code is two times more likely to introduce defects than reviewed code. And we are talking here about uh, post-release um, post and pre-release defects. So defects that you are finding during development and defects that you are finding after, after releasing your software. And the new study, this is a fairly new study um, by a good um, friend and colleague of mine, Alberto Pacelli, and many others, at Google, they showed that 80% of code reviews actually lead to code improvements, right? So code reviews do find bugs and they do help with code improvements. So somehow we have these two motivations that we are that we are after, right? The main motivations for some of the teams, um, they are checked. But on the other hand, um, we see that not all code review feedback is equal. This is a study that uh, we run at Microsoft and we had, we actually analyzed over 2 million code review comments. And we tried to understand, well, uh, in which bucket each comment is, right? And we did that first manually, right? We were interviewing, observing um, developers uh, and uh, trying to find patterns. And then from the patterns that we found, we actually built a classifier, some machine learning that helped us um, classify and, and analyze, well, millions of code review comments because we couldn't have done that actually manually, right? But when we did that, we actually saw that um, first of all, code review comments are in several buckets, right? And documentation, which is about readability of the code, you know, where are where are certain models look modules located? Is the class in the right um, package and so on, right? Um, this these are some of the, the the main code review comments that we have. And not everybody finds them useful, right? So we not only ask them what are the code review comments about, but also do developers find those useful? And we see that especially for documentation, UX design, organization of the code, resources, and logical things, they are either not useful or somewhat useful. And then we have some classes like solution approaches or uh, defects that are completely useful, right? So uh, people, all people, whenever you find something in that class, people would say, well, this, this is really useful to me. And so what we saw from this study is that there are actually three buckets, more or less, where we have the best code review feedback, more or less, our functional defects, missing corner cases, validation, and now we're thinking all about security as well, right? API usage, best practices, um, then okay-ish feedback. And, and this is important that this is actually really valid feedback, but it's, it's not always perceived as such uh, by the code author. And this has to do that code reviews are a socio-technical practice. This means that there's not only the technical perspective, but also a lot of social perspective in it, right? And so um, if you talk about documentation, the coding style, the convention and dispelling mistakes, we saw actually when we interviewed people and we asked them, we saw that they agreed that this is really important, right? This should come up in code review. But then at the same time, if you worked for a week on something <laughs> and you have some cool algorithm that you designed, and then this is somehow still feedback that a little bit stinks, right? Oh, and now you're talking about my comment here that I made the spelling mistakes, right? So um, this feedback is definitely valid and important. Um, but it's not valued as much as finding functional defects. It's not seen as, as important 
Um, and then there are also no-gos, uh, which I don't want to talk too much about here, because I think here we are really more for the security aspects, right? But so there's also a, this nice, I, I like this uh, pyramid, actually, because it's what should we, yeah? I wanted to interrupt you just before, yeah, because sure. slides before uh, you had different categories and I didn't mm -hmm. see security. I would expect to see security. Is that something that you classified in the fact? Or? Um, yeah, exactly. So validation, for example, this is improper validation is definitely something that has to do with security. Resources could be security. Defects um, would be security. And uh, funnily, this this uh, the bucketing, right, is a lot of people ask me about the bucketing. Why did you even call it documentation, right? And why do you have this bucket? Uh, but, you know, this is how research works a little bit. We use an already validated taxonomy, right? So because otherwise we would have to validate our taxonomy within the research that we are doing. And so there was already some research that showed these buckets and these different kinds of feedbacks that there are. And we went from this, um, well, from this, we built up upon those shoulders of, you know, others uh, so that we don't have to validate our own uh, taxonomy again, which now means that, um, you know, you, you have to deal a little bit with, you know, the kind of how people are phrasing it and, and so on. But in this taxonomy, what they had is that um, you could have logic errors could be about security defects, could be about security, even API calls, right? So security would be throughout that, but I definitely think most of the security issues would be in the defect um, the defect bucket here. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Quick question, sure. Michaela, just before yeah. you hop back in, mm -hmm. and I'm yeah, not yeah, sure, sure you're going to, you might be getting here, so you don't have to answer right away, but there is some mm -hmm. chat conversation going on about the, mm -hmm. the ultimate value of code review process and how do you mm -hmm. quantify that? So I don't know if you're getting there, but I just wanted to bring that up, you know, right now. Okay. Okay. Good. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the, the process itself, or is it about like, um, I, I didn't, to be honest, I didn't look at the comments. So is it about um, how how much how much our code review is actually, you know, um, giving if, us or what, what is I it? I think it's really it's just more broadly, like how do you demonstrate ROI? It's a manual process yeah. at the end of the day. I mean, you're talking about machine learning classifiers, which sounds like not a manual process, but you know, it sounds like you've optimized this a little bit, but I think more, if you could just broadly kind of discuss like how maybe how you quantify or measure. Okay. How do you spell that? So how do you spell yeah, that? There, 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 this is a great question, I think. And um, this is definitely a question that is in the area of empirical software engineering, right? So this is my topic as well. Um, and return of investment is not that easy to, to, to think about, right? So what is our return on investment? And I'm going to come to that a little bit. So the, the, the talk definitely or this part here is definitely a little bit about this so that we're thinking about it. There is no um, there is no study that could show the return of investment in an overall view yet. And that has to do um, that, well, return of investment can be can be very can be many things, right? It could be that I'm finding actually defects, I'm improving the code, but it could also be that my engineers are learning, they are collaborating, right? Uh, we are having, a, a, you know, in general, better quality uh, soft software. And this is really hard to measure. So how are we going to measure that? I think when I'm coming back here, I think this is an interesting perspective, right? So when, when I did this study here, actually, the study with where we looked at the um, classifications, uh, we also looked at useful versus not useful feedback, right? As a means of, it's not return of investment that you get like, oh, this is the hours of code review um, that we are doing, and this is the amount that it costs us, and this is the amount that we save, right? This is not this type of, of study that we did, but we did at least look at, well, how many of the comments that you're receiving are useful, right? So this is a small, um, a small view into this, is it even worth it? Is it worth doing, right? And, and so what we saw is that, well, um, the, the code review comments, and I actually don't have that in this presentation, but I can definitely talk about it. The, the code review comments, right? How many of those are useful versus not useful? So the density of it, let's say um, five out of 10 or eight out of 10, right? 50 to 80%, how many are uh, useful depends on the context of the code reviews. And this is definitely something that I'm going to talk about today. How can we actually set up code reviews in a way that we are getting 80% of valuable comments instead of 50%. Um, and when we did this study, we saw that there are many things that are influ influencing that, right? The code characteristics, the code change characteristics, the experience of the reviewer, um, and so on, right? So we want to increase 
um, the value that we are getting out of it. But the ask the question for return of investment is a super important one. And this is actually what I'm what I'm doing um, in my code review workshops. I'm going to talk about more about that a, a little bit later. I just want to also mm -hmm. add just a, a slightly different question because yeah. throughout this SDLC, I find that we we have a lot of different activities. Like um, mm -hmm. we're using automated uh, automated tools. We're scanning. We're doing unit tests. So I would say compared to these other activities, what what does um, what is the value of of uh, code review and why do you think that we should keep doing it instead of relying on, of, on other tools? On tools, yeah. Uh, other tools have, or other processes, I guess. On other processes, yeah. So I think that, I mean, testing and code reviews are two different um, two different things. And maybe I'm, I'm going to hop over here just to, this is maybe an important thing that we want to talk about, right? So code reviews are actually not really about finding bugs, right? So only 15% of the comments are about finding defects, even though I showed you all of that before that, you know, there are studies that show that we are actually finding defects. And even though um, I'm going to today to talk about how we can find security issues here, we see that code reviews are not, I mean, most of the discussions are not about the comments about the defects or about security issues, right? So this is, for example, something that we see here. Most of the things are about readability, organization of the code, right? Modularity. Uh, maybe it's a little bit about solution approach, alternative algorithms and data structure, which we can say, well, maybe for maintainability reasons, performance reasons. But only here, that I, I actually made a bug here, right? So only those things that are marked with a bug, those um, categories fall under defects, right? And so we see there are not so many. And even from those, only a small percentage is real bugs. And then from those bugs, you know, a small percentage is actually security, right? So we could say actually our code review is really good in finding bugs. And I authored with, uh, with colleagues of mine at, at Microsoft, I authored a paper that was called um, Code Reviews Do Not Find Bugs. And this was definitely a little bit like um, a title so that it caught the eye of the reader. But what we wanted to say is exactly that there are only 50 percent of the comments are about defects so if you want to find bugs um maybe testing is 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 a better mechanism but on the other hand it's also something that you cannot um, leave out so there are also studies that show that the kind of defects that you're finding they are not they're not the same in the same buckets and i actually have like this um this is from the OVAS code review guide right and we saw similar things in in, in research but not specific for security, where we see that, well, actually, kind of issues that we are finding, they are not the same for whatever um, technique we are using. And here would be, for example, source code scanning tools or automated tools, manual penetration testing, manual code reviews, right? And so we see business logic, for example, is really hard to find in an automated way, right? So how, how, should, the, how should the tool do, know what we are doing? And so my standpoint here is, um, Automated tools are really good, and especially like static, um, static analysis tools, style checkers, and all of that. You know, your your developers should not talk about you know tabs versus um, you know versus spaces or um, how where where are our you know like um, braces or something like this. They should really focus on the important thing, and we will see later that. The cognitive process, right? The cognitive load that we have at code reviews is really large. And, and because of that, because we have such a cognitive load here, we are not even finding the issues, right? If you so, for example, when I was preparing today, I was thinking, like, what should I do? And I was thinking, well, let's look through some real world example. But how are we going to find the vulnerabilities within an hour, right? And how many, how are we going to find some some you know, important ones and even enough. It's like watching a football match where nobody scores, right? <laughs> uh, and I think it's even it's a little bit more boring to look that uh, to look and see how somebody analyzes um, code review or code, right? And do code reviews. And so I think what we have to what we have to have um, or understand is that code reviews are actually really good. We don't want to we. We don't want to not miss the things that we find in code reviews. These are important things. And very often, those are things that cannot be found somewhere else, hopefully, because you did already the easy stuff with the automated tools, right? So this is another step that helps us get to better, more secure, more correct code. But actually, a lot of the comments, and they are still useful, are about something else. They're about um, 
that people are actually understanding more of the code base. And this in turn, right, will help them to find more security issues because they are more familiar. We did studies um, where we, for example, looked at how, how often does a reviewer have to see code that can give more useful feedback. And so there, there are a lot of um, benefits that are not directly related to, to security issues or you know, finding defects. And maybe if you think about code reviews, it's readability, right? Maintainability, knowledge sharing, mentoring, learning. But then if we have those, we are again, I mean, if you're if you're mentoring, if you're learning, if you know more about your code base, if you have a more readable, more maintainable code base, what are you going to get out of that? A more secure code base as well, right? So code reviews, I think there are a lot of tangible and intangible um, benefits that we are getting out of. And we really have to understand as an organization for our return of investment, we have to understand um, where we are coming from, what are we after, and then change our policies according to that. I didn't want to talk actually about this, but it came up. So uh, this is my favorite topic. This is actually what I'm, what I'm doing with organizations, right? So most of my code review workshops, they're not on security per se, but they are on how can we make sure that we are getting the most out of code reviews um, and making sure that we are using them in a good way. And so everybody, like if, I, if I'm showing this picture, right? So we are getting all of these benefits. Um, and then we are imagining now all these thousands and hundred thousands of organizations that now have code reviews because it's coming out of the box of you know GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket and whatnot, right? They're all doing code reviews now. So they are now all so happy and they're getting all these benefits. And that's not the reality. What we see is that while well, there are so many pain points that we have with code reviews, waiting, interruption, large reviews, low feedback quality, difficult reviews. And this comes back to return of investment, right? So even if I'm getting the security and like I'm revealing a security issue, which would be like the trophy of you know code reviews. Um, was it worth it, right? Was it worth the, the, the velocity, the, the reduced velocity that we have, the waiting time, the interruption, the context switch? And so it's really important. And, and what I can say is that from my experience, it is worth it, but people really have to define and think about their processes and how they do code reviews in a very deliberate way. Um, and, and yeah, and, and this is, and, and this is, I think this is very important. I'm, I'm often having this, <laughs> it's, um, it's a code review quadrant, um, that we can see, well, code review speed somehow, right? From slow to fast and then feedback value from low to high. And all of that surrounds now the return of investment question, I would say. Um, and so if you, if you have like this blocking review, so you have sloppy reviews and, and, and it takes still quite some time to get that but the feedback is not really high this is not really a good place to be right and people want to be in this power review have thorough reviews and they're delivered in a timely manner right so fast review speed but still high value and well there are a lot of questions i don't want to go too much yeah. into that but if if people have questions i'm happy to talk about more more about this but um so what i show and 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 what what we can actually do is we can actually increase the process speed and the feedback value at the same time. Um, whereby if you're looking at, at the code reviewer perspective, right? So somebody in front of their code, there is, we are bound to how long they take, right? So if you're increasing the time or, or making them review code faster, it will be more sloppy, right? So most of the time that that's what's coming out, but the process speed per se, we can actually increase that and still increase the feedback value. So there's actually um, a question yeah. Um, mm -hmm. from, oh, I just lost it. I think it was Chris, Chris Jones. Um, okay. Oh my goodness. I lost it. No. In <laughs> I got it. it Pierre. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Um, no, go, you go for it. I'm sorry. I'm, oh, there it is. <laughs> how can you scale? Uh, so his question is, uh, how could you scale code review in an environment with a high release cycle? something like a company like Amazon, where they release code 11.2, uh, 11.7 seconds. Um, how can you scale out? So well, I cannot directly talk about uh, Amazon, but for example, I can talk about Google, which I think also has a very uh, frequent release uh, cadence, right? And so what Google does, for example, they're Google, like they have, they have like, they have a very similar department um, at Google that researches code reviews than the department that I have been in 
um, at Microsoft, right? So I, I know even uh, researchers there and so on. But what they also showed is that, um, and this is going back to the study that I showed before, right? That they have 80% of the code reviews actually introduced changes. They showed that the return, the turnaround time for code reviews is four hours at Google, right? So four hours from I'm sending you the code review, you're sending me feedback back, I'm making changes, I'm sending it to you again, you know, maybe there's some back and forth. And then we say, well, this is great, right? So now I'm, I'm, I'm committing my changes. Four hours. And I mean, this is really fast. <laughs> Um, if, if you know a little bit about other companies, right, we're talking about days, we're talking about weeks of code review turnaround times. Um, and so the question is, how is Google doing it, right? Google does it, um, but, but again, being very deliberate about it. They are very deliberate about that. Well, if you have a slow code review process, all is lost, right? And so this is their, more or less, this is their um, philosophy and not only philosophy, they, they did quite some research in that area, right? So um, what they really try is to make code reviews fast um, and as fast as possible. And that will tell you, I think the main reasons why it's so fast at Google. First of all, um, they have super small changes. They have 90% of all the code changes have only um, 10 files Okay, 10 files doesn't sound so small, but 24 lines of code, right? This is int interesting, right? 24 lines of code. And now we are thinking about, let's say the average company and the average uh, code review. Um, I've seen quite a few of them and they're probably between 500 and you know whatever <laughs> large number you can come up with, right? Uh, but 24 lines of code is something that, well, if you send it to me, I think I can do it. Right. I, I think I can do it right now. And if I thinking bad about the pain points, like waiting, um, being interrupted, it's definitely interruption. Uh, but if I know, I know, right, I scheduled my day around that, that I'm getting several requests that are, you know, 10 lines of code to review or, you know, 20 lines of code to review, um, then I can actually schedule this into my day to day work. Another thing, um, um, it's not only the small, um, small, small um, PRs that they are having, pull requests or code reviews that they are having, but they also have very strict guidelines. Now you think, well, very strict guidelines, how does this fit into? Well, it fits into because people don't have to think about, you know, is this now a go or no go? Um, do we do it this way or the other way? They have extremely straight um, coding guidelines, right? So everybody knows how the coding guidelines look at, um, at, at, Google, how are we writing JavaScript code? Not only JavaScript code, but JavaScript code in a specific framework. They have guidelines for that. And then they have reviewers there that are trained for that, right? So they are trained for looking at JavaScript, Angular code, for example. And, and they also have owners and they have strict guidelines in a way that every code change has to be um, approved by an owner and by a person that is certified in that language, right? Um, and now I think the most important part why they can do it so fast is that 75% of all the code changes are reviewed by one person, right? So there's one other person that reviews that. So this means also that they have enough people that are trained that have this certification, the language certification, and they have enough owners. Um, and they also, because Google, they, as I said, they are also doing research on code reviews and research suggests that two reviewers is actually not the best, <laughs> the best number, uh, sorry, one reviewer is not the best number, right? So we should have at least two reviewers on a code review. They are finding more issues, they are finding more bugs. Um, but now Google makes again a deliberate choice and say, well, um, it's okay for us, we have so small changes and we rather have this um, review frequency or cadence that we only add one person. Um, and, and this is more important for us than having an, another person that having this scheduling issue. I'm not saying that they are not adding other people. They don't have always one person, but they also understand probably the differences in changes, right? What is the risk associated to this change? And do I need like one person? Is that okay? Or do I need even five person for this kind of change that we are having here? And if you're thinking about security, there's also a security paper. Maybe if I'm coming to it, I don't know, um, in my presentation, um, it's about understanding security reviews. And what they, for example, looked at is, 
um, how many people do we have to add to find, you know, all the security vulnerabilities that they see that, right? And they had to add, you know, 15, 20 people, right? So there was there wasn't one person that found all of them. Um, we see actually that that we have to add a lot of people that they understand the security um, or, or find all of the security vulnerabilities, right? But this is again return of investment. Would we do that, right? Do we want to find everything? What's important to us? So risk assessment, I think, is a very very important. Uh, part here in the, when I'm working with organization, I really help them understand the goals that they have for code reviews, then understanding the code changes, the different kinds of code changes that we have and how many people should be on there. Um, and, and, you know, for every reviewer, you should know why you're adding them. Um, so you should not just add reviewer just because. <laughs> um, yeah, this was a probably a long, a long, a long um, discussion, but yeah. Yeah. No, I think people always uh, um, have, you know, diverging opinions on this topic. I've experienced this myself a lot, so it's a good it's a good discussion. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, how do we make sure that we actually find these important issues, right? So I, I showed you and I, I told you already that people are um, having troubles finding that. Now, first of of the the important thing is that we actually know what we are looking for, right? So I. I um, have here the OBAS top 10 right, issues um, and have the link here as well. I think everybody is familiar here, but I think it's always good to, to, to look at that and actually look and, and read about it. And especially if you're talking about developers, um, I don't think that everybody you know, can, can list them off the top of their head. And maybe we don't have to do that, right? Maybe we have to understand the mechanisms that are behind that. And then if you're thinking about the common weaknesses here, for example, we see that we have 40 categories, right? With 418 weaknesses. So this seems very overwhelming. And then again, if you're thinking about, well, 25 most dangerous software um, weaknesses, even 25 um, is not um, it's not a small number, right? It's a large number that people have to keep in mind and this comes back to the cognitive load that we are having, right? So can we actually process all of that when we are looking at the code? Um, and here, this is maybe, um, again, taken from the OBAS uh, code review guide zero, uh, 2.0. Um, and it shows actually those top 10, the OBAS top 10, this is the injection box, uh, for example, and how code reviews compares, for example, to scanning tools or manual penetration testing. And we see that, you know, in different areas, we have strengths and weakness, weaknesses for, for manual code review versus um, source code scanning tools. But we actually see that, you know, manual code reviews are is doing quite well, right? So it's something that definitely should be in our, our toolbox. And I think it would be really important and coming back to the cognitive load, it's really important that the developer themselves that are familiar with the with the environment, that they do the basics um, to make sure that, you know, some of the common things are actually found in code reviews or even, you know, not even make it to the code review, right? And so one Sorry, of the things, um, yeah. Just mm -hmm. on the previous slide, mm -hmm. it's quite interesting because I was looking at manual code reviews and on the graph you have A5. I'm one of the cool people that know the OWASP top 10, but A5, which is broken access control. Mm -hmm. And that's the only one where the code review is the best. And I've always thought of broken access control, you know, is make sure I, sim I simplify it, make sure everyone's not an admin or at least privileges, all that. And that is more I call a semantic rather than a, you know, syntax error. So I'm looking at the chart, that's kind of where, you know, code review really steps in and do you think there are any other vulnerabilities where um, code review, you know, you can really help over, say, you know, scanning or automated or anything that like from your experience? Well, I think everywhere we really have to understand the business logic as well, right? So everything where um, it's it's not mainly checking, you know, inputs and, and, and tools are great for that, right? So this is why I also said, well, if, if for example, if you think about, you know, the person sitting um, in front of the code and then they are going through the code and try to have different inputs here. I mean, this is really a waste of time. If you're thinking about, you know, return of investment, they should write a test, <laughs> right? The, the test can do it um, much faster, a much more comprehensive, a broader range, and you can run it over and over and over again, right? Um, but if you're thinking about, for example, uh, the business logic and how that um, works with our, with our um, code, or also understanding, for example, um naming convention all of that their manual code reviews i think are, are much better 
Um, and, and that can just not be, yeah, not be done with, um, with the scanning tools. And I actually have like, um, yeah, I have, I have another slide for that, but yeah. Awesome. I hope that Thank un you. answers your question. Yeah, definitely. But, but maybe coming back and I'm, I'm going quickly co going back to this list, right? And I think this list is really big. Um, and so what really helps is if you have code review checklists and not only for security, right? So um, I actually made a secure code review checklist here that we can actually look at later on. But um, in general, code review checklists, even for implementation or logic error readability, they are so, so important. And why are they important? Well, not because you go through each line of code and look at your checklist, um, but because it helps you to think about something. And maybe if you've worked with this checklist over and over again, you just need the, the, the heading, right? <laughs> or you just need some, some words that trigger something and you think, oh yeah, exactly, I forgot that, right? And so there was actually an interesting ex experiment that they did at the University of Zurich um, where they asked people about you know, some, some code review and doing the code review and they had to find the issues. Um, and then after they thought, well, now I looked through everything, they gave them some, you know, just some, some primers, right? Oh, have you thought about security? Have you thought about authentication? And it's like, oh my God, I forgot about that, right? And so if, if people just have these little inputs, they can go again and suddenly they find a, a large variety of different uh, issues. And so a lot of organizations that I'm working with, they also have problems with um, the, the thoroughness that it's not the same or, or some teams are much more thorough, even individuals are much more thorough in code reviews than others, right? And a code review checklist can really help you, you know, streamline that a little bit. So I'm going to just show a, a couple of things that are in my little list. Like this is not the large uh, security, um, secure code review list, but the one that I would include for every code, um, code review, right? So in general, what are some of the security vulnerabilities um, that we have to think of if you look at this code, right? Authorization, authentication. And again, I think this checklist is more that we are thinking about the different concepts um, and, and that we are not forgetting about this. Um, I think it's also important to have, you know, know about this web security principles, read about them. And, um, and and so this is a little bit of training and I will come to that a little bit later because I want to do, I hope we have still some time, I want to do a code review with you. And so we will go back to this list and see if it's actually helping us, right? I don't know if yeah. it's something that you'll talk about a bit later, mm -hmm. but I wanted to discuss maybe um, tooling. Uh, I know that on the show we've had guests talk to us about CodeQL, about SEMGrep, about different um, you know static analysis tool. Are these things that you also use during your your code review or that help to reduce the effort um, for code reviews? Oh, definitely. I think people should definitely um, use um, automated tools as much as possible, right? Always balancing a little bit like the drawbacks that we have, for example, with false negatives, right? So if you <laughs> if you're falling into this category that we have a lot of false negatives that are holding us back, that can be a problem. And so I always I always recommend that um, organization really make sure that those tools and the configuration and and you know the making sure that the tools run correctly and give us valuable input is done by a larger um, effort, right? It's not only one team or one engineer, right? That wants to, you know, have this tool, but that it's owned collectively so that, you know, everybody can also benefit from the right configuration and people are spending time on, on making sure that those tools are actually giving a valuable output, right? But I, I think it's so important that we have that we have that um, in our in our environment and then making sure that um, that for us it's on the on the right level, right? So I, I I'm not recommending, you know, this or that tool, but there are some tools, especially static analysis tools, for example, that should run with every, you know, with every um, CI uh, in in the CI pipeline, right? So with every with every time that you're actually building the code, those tools should work or run as well. Um, yeah. Okay. Awesome. Um, so, well, the question that I actually ask at the beginning is how, how are we making sure that we are finding the right things that we are looking, you know, if we are looking at this pyramid that we are looking at, you know, correctness, security, and that we are finding those issues that are so important for the thing. And one 
one one thing that comes up over and over in our studies is that well experience matters right so it matters that you know about those stuff that i just showed before a uh, code review checklist can really help also junior engineers to you know learn about those things or also um senior engineers to just uh um like a bridging thing that they that they just check if they thought about everything but the experience helps but not only experience with um with security, but also experience with the code base, right? And this is the study that I talked about before. It's called an empirical study on the effectiveness of security code reviews, right? Um, and they have, they actually recruited 20 or 30, sorry, 30, 30 people, right? 30 professional developers and security experts to do a code review on um, a known vulnerable code base. Um, it was actually a CMS, CMS system, right? Um, and none of them, None of them found all of the security vulnerabilities. And if you can see, I mean, this is the um, this is how many people you actually have to add. This is the, the curve, right? So that you're finding most of the security vulnerabilities. And you see that the number of people is really high. What, what this says is just that it's really hard <laughs> to find security vulnerabilities in code, right? This is a study that we did at Microsoft and it shows um, the reviewers' numbers of prior reviews in the file, right? So um, we looked at how, how much useful feedback are they giving, depending on how often have they seen the file before. Not contributed to, right? They didn't even write in this file, but at least they saw it. And we can see that, well, if people haven't seen, so they are really new to that file, they haven't seen that file before. And this is independent of their expertise, you know, independent of, you know, seniority and so on they have a hard time giving really valuable feedback it's below 40 percent so most of the most of the um feedback that they give comments are not really seen as useful and now this is one right they have seen it one time before and suddenly they they start to really be able there's a big jump they are able to give useful feedback and you can see it it increases a little bit until five and then it plateaus over time right and so having context about the code that I'm looking at is so important. And this is also why I think it's so important that the developers themselves, not only the security matter experts or the subject matter experts, are doing code reviews, right? Um, there should be, there should be both um, that should do that, right? But there should be some low hanging fruits that developers themselves should actually look at because they will find those issues, um, especially those issues that are um, depending on the business logic much better than somebody that hasn't seen the code before or, you know, has to look at several hundred thousands lines of code instead of like 400 or maybe like Google 24. Um, understanding the context, and, and, and we will see that a little bit later in the code review, right? Um, understanding context is so important. So, for example, a, a lot of companies, they just have the code review and they don't fill in the description, right? But the description is really important. And here we have, again, these two perspectives that the person that did the change, they're so familiar with it. They are the expert of the change. They forget that for another person, it's actually complicated, right? I will show you very simple code, <laughs> but I'm, I'm sure that if you look at it, you think like, well, I don't know exactly what's going on here. And so you will need a lot of your cognitive brain power actually to look through that code. There's actually a really nice book that I want to um, uh, refer to, it, um, which is which is it's written right now as we're speaking by a friend of mine, Feline Hermans. It's called The Programmer's Brain. I'm just reading it um, online as she, she provides some of the chapters. And she talks about a lot about cognitive load, right? And so I think in code reviews, this is so important as well. Um, code reviews means that if I'm if I have to understand, you know, what is this code change actually accomplishing? Um, why did the person come up with that? So I'm thinking about all of that. How should I actually find security issues here? So there are a lot of things that you can actually put in here. Yeah. Yeah. Just a question from the chat. Mm -hmm. um, let me scroll up. Okay. So the graph you had presented, I think, two slides back. Um, okay. Favored a lot of open source tooling, right? And then there was some commentary about how open source itself has vulnerabilities that we're all extremely familiar with. So, I mean, is that something that becomes a thing in the code review process in terms of, I mean, tool selection and vulnerability of tools that you might be using? Or how do you approach that, really? I mean, because you're sort of going down the rabbit hole here. Okay. So, um, can you can you explain when when was that? Um, you said that uh, the graph or the the, the slide 
favored open source tooling? Which which slide was that? Yeah, I think if you went back, yeah, when you were talking about this. Uh, about some, this one? Yeah, there was a comment about okay. open source tooling and then just the security of open source itself and using open source tooling versus okay. commercial tooling. I mean, it's, okay. yeah. Yeah, so probably there are two things. I think um, maybe I, Maybe I should explain the slide again in very few words because this slide has nothing to do with open source tooling. So what the slides show is a study that we did at Microsoft, and these are all actually internal um, internal software projects, right? Azure, Bing, sorry, Exchange, it's, it's, Office. It's the Studio. previous slide from here. I'm sorry. Yeah. This yeah. one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, this also, I think, is only yeah. It doesn't have a lot to do with, with open source. They used one open source software um, to with, which has known vulnerabilities um, to recruit people and ask them to find out those. But this was this was and um, the they obscured it, right? So people didn't know that this is actually an open source tool. So they hired engineers and asked them to, to review some of those code. Right, so I just want to make sure that this has nothing to do with open source per se. It's just a finding that they recruited 30 people um, from different, you know, like uh, hiring platforms <laughs> that said that they know how to, you know, do code reviews. They are experienced developers, and some of them were security experts. And even the developers had to pass some tests that they actually know about security. And then they asked them, so look at this code, right? And they, they shadowed that code a little bit. They obscured that code so that they, they couldn't say, well, this is actually a, you know, this open source library. And they had to find the vulnerabilities that were in there, and they even seeded some. Um, and this just shows that there were a lot of people that they had to to gather yeah. the, the, the feedback from a lot of people to look at that. Yeah. Right? I guess right. the link to, to open source is, uh, like Andrew is saying, more eyes equal more value. So open source okay. means that more people are yeah. looking at it, so therefore less. Okay, I yeah, think, yeah. I think I yeah. might have misunderstood the chat, so I'll own that bad question. Yeah, no, no problem. I just so. wanted to make sure that um, I, yeah. I I explain it in a good way. But yeah, and, and the other question, I think it's a very valid question is, you know, there's like this Linus law, right? All bugs are shallow with enough eyes or something like this, right? <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, well, we, we see that not everybody has this perspective, perspective, right? So I think there are a lot of people say, well, open source um, software is actually superior to internal software. Some people think it's not, right? Um, but what's definitely a fact is that a lot of internal software or open source software depends on open source software right and we see that open software can act, open source software can actually be extremely problematic um, and that if we are building upon that without even thinking about or understanding our dependencies um, then then this can be a, a problem and there are also for example this is an area I think where automated tools are really really good, right? So if you're using an automated tool to find out which dependencies you're, um, or, or which open source uh, libraries you're depending on, and if they have um, known issues, vulnerabilities, uh, th that you're notified about that. Um, because, you know, if you do that manually, it's probably a very cumbersome task and it's, it's, it's not very a good return of investment for your time, right? So um, going back and having like tooling here that tells you, well, these are my dependencies and here are some um, security vulnerabilities, I think is a very, very important step that everybody should have in, in their um, in their life cycle, in their um, security life cycle, and also making sure that we are thinking about what are we adding in here, right? And are we exposing, there was, for example, a company that I worked with uh, that had, that used a logging software that had some vulnerabilities and that actually exposed them to, you know, some drastic um, flaws themselves, right? Where they were exposing sensitive sensitive data and so on. And so, yeah, I think it's a, it's important to see that. And um, maybe it's, it's it's not completely. I, I don't know if I'm even going to do the code review. I have to do the code review. Yeah, yeah, let's do I'm it. I think we should. Much, right? Like, I'm talking too yeah. much about here, but um, maybe the change size is the last thing that I wanted to show. Right. So the change size is so important if you have like larger number, and I talked about this at the beginning, right? If you have more files, and it doesn't matter which size metrics you take, the change lines changed and so on, right? Um, the value actually goes down, right? This is a very similar study that we showed, um, that, that shows the same thing from Cisco. 
Um, and, and even if you have like more time for more lines of code, it doesn't matter, right? So if you have like a thousand lines of code, you can give them um, a lot of time. It doesn't matter, right? Automation, we talked about that. Let me see if there's something. So let's do a code review. I want to show you a little bit of code review. Awesome. Um, so let me let me open that up because we don't have too much time. So it's a code review um, of a junior engineer here, right? That uh, just uh, did uh, a little bit of uh, wrote a little bit of code here, right? So um, maybe who wants to start? So how would you start such a code review, right? So there actually this is this is the code. I can navigate for you. What what would you do first if you do that code review for that for the code change? Try to get a feel for, I guess, the language. What are we dealing with? Orient mm -hmm. yourself here. Looks like some okay. HTML, JavaScript. Um, now I see more JavaScript. Mm -hmm. Thinking it might be Node. Maybe looking for routes, endpoints. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see some SQL. I don't know. What do you guys see? And now you're on mute. I see you talking. <laughs> no, I was thinking the same thing with the, with the node. I would try to figure out what exactly, what is it trying to get out of the, in that script, that server.js. Um, I'm just okay. going, talking about that port. What else? So Maybe what like about, what it does. Yeah. 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 What is it trying to do? I don't know. Redeem looks yeah. like a great endpoint. Okay. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so Fatback says I'm, he reading, sees tiny like ants. Well, maybe we want to make the screen just a tad, <laughs> tad bigger. Okay, yeah. yeah. So um, are, we, are we reading the comments now? Yeah, no, just... Or, or uh, are we not? Oh, yeah, we read comments, I think. Yeah, okay, good. Yeah. Cool. When so they're there. This is also something, yeah, it's all, all, often... I try to find a to-do. Right? <laughs> oh, yeah, to-do. <laughs> okay. So let's, Im let's imagine that we have actually a code review description here, right? How would that change our whole game? And this code review description tells us, well, this is actually an, uh, um, a functionality, right? It's only part of a change, right? That introduces the redeem function. Um, and the redeem function allows a, a gamer, it's a game, right? So we are actually a gaming platform and gamers get credits for what they're doing. And with these credits, they can actually buy more hours uh, to game a little bit more, right? Um, and so in this in this code change, what happens is that we implemented the redeem credits function where a person can enter by a web form. Um, they can enter actually the credits that they want to redeem against or, or you know, change uh, to gaming hours. Is that helping? Yeah, I think we're, yep. Yeah. Okay, so what would you, would would you do next? Should we run that code? Yeah, I mean, node help? stuff. Let's do it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, let me see. Actually, I have it here. It's beautiful. Look mm. at that. <laughs> okay, so we can actually redeem some credits. I put four credits here, and I I'm sending it. Oh, and the user got four credits. So that's that's all my I, I implemented that today for this wonderful uh, time that we have here. So it's a little uh, application. I didn't want to make it too big. So yeah. do you have any uh, other ideas? What what should we do? What should we? Look? I guess I guess tracing each one of those calls that that redeem credits function is is doing mm -hmm. so player player mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. um, so it's let's game. For, yeah. yeah. So what we see of, here is actually get player level, right? Then we convert some credits to hours. And then we redeem the hour to player. But let's let, look at the get player level, right? Returns the level of the player. How does that look? So I can see it in the comments, and I, I've seen it as well. Um, but mm -hmm. line 50 looks like an SQL injection because it's not parameterized when you, um, you know, the plus yeah, player right. ID. Yeah, exactly. The player ID, right? So we have like a string that we are adding here to another string, and we could actually mm -hmm. send anything here. Antonio is correct. Yeah, capitals. <laughs> okay. Something else. Here we have probably the same, right? So this is also happening very often. If you have like one error, 
you actually have like a class of errors that are people are doing the same mistake over and over again. So if you're looking at this, we're seeing seeing again that um, people are concatenating strings together and then executing them. <laughs> All the Is this something else? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, go ahead, Nikki. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm just looking at that update query. If if old hours, if I had put new hours as a negative or a positive, I think it might just process that. Okay. Just do integer math on that. Is which is sort yeah. of like SQL injection related. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So no no impro no proper input validation as well, right? So right. we are having old hours. We are getting them from the database. Um, and we're having like the new hours, maybe something else we are adding them, could uh, um, subtract them as well, yeah. Right, yeah, if you just put a giant negative number, it would probably mm -hmm. just add the negative and then, yeah. Yeah, then a little bit later, so we redeem the hours here and then we have like charge credits from player here. Let's go over here. Well, we already spotted that, we have that over here, I don't want it to be very, uh, consistent with my errors, <laughs> um, but um, what else is happening here? <clears throat> so here we are actually redeeming the hours to player, right? So we are getting the hours and then later on, once we have the hours, right? We um, remove or charge the credits from the player. And so we have the old credits and the new credits. I'm interested with the error that's being thrown. I'd be like, and under what circumstances do we have the light try catch? You know, how easily could it be to mm -hmm. you know, not charge the credits? Like, is, is that a big hole kind of waiting to happen? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or I guess you could do the same thing with the credits that you did with the hours. Yeah. Ha have the math not deduct. But add, right? So we could actually yeah. add here. OK, yeah, let's go added. back. Let's go back to our implication that we saw here. Maybe something else that, that we realized that we see here. So redeem credits 4 plus 100. 4 plus 100. OK. This know. is what Let's we want to redeem. Okay. Ooh. 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 <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, good one. Yeah, Something someone from else? the chat said yeah. stored cross stored cross site scripting might be happening here. I don't actually know if you store that. It could be reflected, but um it looks like mm -hmm. maybe I could just drop some JavaScript in that credits. Yeah, exactly. You could because I'm just taking it. There's no input validation yeah. if you go back. Um, and I think this is actually happening here, right? So if we if we get that, we don't do anything with it, right? We have the request body, we have the credits, we have the body, we have the user ID, and we, we store that, and then we just use that, whatever is there, right? So there's no input validation in redeem credits before we're using that as well. Maybe because I know we are running a little bit out of time. Maybe I tell you a little bit more um, but there, there are so many. I see that too many things, so that we find a lot of things. <laughs> As I actually wrote a very crappy application. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, another thing that happens here, if you're looking at the redeem credits, right, and, um, and then we see that well, it gets the player level, right, um, and so it selects the player from where player ID is the player. Well, we talked about that. This could be, you know, I could have. SQL injection here, I could drop actually things maybe, right? If I say, say player ID and then um, the player ID is actually part of this one. Have a look here. The player ID is the user ID, right? So I could actually add other things here as well. Um, um, let, me, let me go back here. Another thing that happens is, well, if you're purchasing this, we're having actually two steps, right? Which are not atomic. So we are executing this query here where we update the hours. First of all, there could be, as you said, minus hours and so on, right? But we are updating the hours 
and then we are charging the credit later on. Uh, but what happens, you know, if if there is a is a problem over there? Um, it could be that we are never charging the player for for the hours that they are having, right? And so this should be also an atomic um, application. Another thing that happens here. We didn't look at that at all because we didn't have like enough time. It's like we are converting the credits to hour because it's not one-to-one -one, um, conversion, but the method actually converts something. So I'm, I'm just leaving it here. Maybe you spot the problems, not sure. I'm always looking at the worst case, like the try catch. I'm like, okay, what about the final else? Like, I'm just mm -hmm. trying to think, what what would happen for for that? How big is that catch all? Is it a lazy developer, or um, is that a si significant? Because I like things to be, you know, mm -hmm. ordered. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Yeah. Are you looking at this convert credits to hours um, function? Trying I to... would also want to know how, how many levels are there? Because I can see mm -hmm. under three, three to eight. Is it like there's 10 levels? Is there 3,000 levels? Exactly, don't yeah. You don't know, right? So, oh, yeah. And these are actually yep. magic numbers as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Right. Um, and if you put the letter, if you put the number three in, it looks like someone from the chat spotted this. It's it's an edge case or it's a unmanaged case. Exactly. Will, I don't know. Yeah, if it's if, if it's smaller than three, if it's larger than three, and then it's the else case. But um, we probably want it to be if it's you know three, it should be either player levels, so it should either go into that bucket or in this one, right? Um, yeah, that's 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 that, that's a good. It's a very good input. Um, I just want to, you know, because I know we are running out of time, I just want to give you a little bit like some input here. Like if we're looking at this, well, we looked at data validation, right? Input validation. We looked a little bit, we talked a little bit about error handling, which doesn't seem like very appropriate. Logging, we don't have really logging going on here, right? So we don't know that people did something, we don't log something here. But what about authentication? What's the kind of authentication that we are doing here? I didn't see any. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was gonna say, I was like, I don't. Did we do any? Like, no, we didn't. This no, website. Yeah. Someone said that exactly, really yeah. early on. <laughs> I need to find yeah. that comment. Yeah, there is no authentication, right? And so, um, who do we know that this? I could actually change the user ID here, right? I say I'm now user seven, and we're charging some credits. Um, you know, like we redeem things here. So there's no authentication or authorization. There's no session management and so on. Um, yeah, I just, I just um, because I probably want to wrap up here, I think for a developer, from a developer perspective, right, and not from a subject matter expert and security expert um, perspective, which I think you guys, you're looking at so much more, <laughs> uh, which probably bro blows our developer mind. But I think those are really the important stuff that I think every developer should look um, when they're looking at code reviews should look at, right? Data validation is something that you do all the time. Um, and everything should be validated and error handling. I mean, you're handling errors. How are we going to handle them? How do we do the logging? Authentication and session management and authorization, I think, is also something that's you use it quite often. But if there is the proper things in place, um, then you know it's it's already quite okay, right? So you have to think about authentication and the whole me mechanisms behind it, maybe while design and then we, we make changes to it, but then you can reuse it, right? And, and know actually how, how things work. Same for cryptography, I think, but especially data validation, error handling, logging, and then session management and making sure that we are always authenticated and authorized, authorized to do something. I think those are really important parts. Maybe a, a couple of things that I just want to talk about. Um, and, and I'm not going to go through all of that because there's so many great stuff out there, especially from OWASP. Um, uh, but also many others where we can read about this. But data and input validation, for example, is so important, I think, that I just wanted to make, uh, you know, 
tell you about about some of the best practices which is well we try to have exact matches right whenever we can so if there's and 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 i think maybe what's also important here is that we think about user input is not only what the user can input but also hidden fields like drop lists um or also like if if, if you have like checkboxes that we make sure especially for checkboxes and things like this that we have really exact matches. So we know, well, there are only four different items. So I only allow those four items. No other items are allowed, right? So be as restrictive as you can. Then you can do a good, a known good approach. Um, uh, use a good known good approach, right? Where you have like an allow list. So I know uh, what, what is allowed as input. Or you have like uh, the known bad approach where you know, well, um, I, I cannot, you know, the, the allow list would be too big. So I'm, I'm doing the reverse and say, well, I'm not allowing those characters, for example, here. Um, but, you know, check everything, the type, the length, the ch characters, right? And, and in the code that I showed you, we didn't do any of that, right? <laughs> um, then also contextual escaping, I think, is something that's even better than, you know, um, input um, sanitizing, right? So instead of replacing stuff, uh, which, you know, can lead to very weird um, side effects as well, and you know, if you, for example, for names, if you if you replace some characters, you know, some people can be very upset because their names contain those weird characters and so on, right? So, um, or or it's not the right, it's not what the user actually intended. So, uh, contextual escaping, which means that if I'm, you know, if I'm using something for JSON, then you know, I escape it in a way that it's not runnable JSON code and so on. And uh, very important also always validate on the server side, right? Again, maybe you have several levels of um, um, input validation here. Use parameterized queries. We didn't do that at all. <laughs> um, and why, why I'm talking about this so much? Because I think there are so many, um, so many attacks that are actually you know, linked to improper validation. It's really low hanging fruit that everybody should look at, right? Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about authentication because I want to show you one one cool thing that I um, when I when I researched for this talk, right, and thought like, what can I show you guys? Um, well, first of all, I made this little example, which I didn't spend enough time. Um, hopefully, I can use it again. But <laughs> um, but I also came across something else, um, and this was about authentication because I think authentication again is also a very important uh, part, as I said. Um, and so when we do authentication, we only we're not only have to think about you know how long should be the passwords, but also how are we going to do all these attempts? Like if somebody has uh, forgotten their um, their password, how are we going to have those routines, right? And so when I when I was re researching a little bit on that, I came across this um, website, Secure Code Barrier, and I know um, <laughs> we have uh, one person here on the show as well. But I I really I, I thought it's such a cool thing. Because um, now when we look at all these, uh, also the checklist that I had, right? As a developer, it's not something on one hand we have to do with it every day. But on the other hand, if you're just reading through those things, they're not becoming real, I think. We are not experiencing the problems per se. And so I did actually a little uh, mission. They, they did a little bit like a game. And I did the mission and where we had to research, um, we have to reset the password. I'm going to show it um, real quick. And then I know I takes a little bit longer everything than I anticipated. But um, let me see where did I have that here, right? So you're coming to this website. And I really liked it. I think it's an open mission. I'm not I'm not sure. I got it <laughs> via email. Um, so maybe um, uh, I think it's an open thing that uh, everybody that signs up here can try. It's, um, it's it the is. code stash bin mission, right? Um, and what I really like is, so first of all, you have, again, you see this, this login site, and then it, it gives you some instructions where you can walk through. And it helps you really think about the, the authentication and, and the procedures that we have around, right? And so the first question is, well, we have this code stash bin company, and they have like a very normal uh, login field, right? Username and password. And we should analyze it and see if we realize if we want to, you know, be an attacker. What can we do with it? <laughs> um, and uh, so they, the first instruction was trigger a password reset email for the admin user, right? And so, wow, how should we do that? And they ask you, well, do you not notice some useful information here? And there is admin at code stash bin. So I saw that and I thought, well, probably this is like an admin, right? <laughs> and so it gives us already some credential, right? One part of the credential that we can actually fill in. So we would have to guess the password. 
Um, but the, the challenge goes a little bit further. I'm not I'm not sure if I should give it away because we're also running out of time, so everybody can do it on their own. But I found it really cool uh, because what it shows is that, well, here, for example, um, you have one of the principles that you're not giving away user authentication. And if you look at um, authentication, I'm going to pull up here my code review checklist. I'm just going to show you several several things, right? So this is, for example, my GitHub, and one of the things that I uh, um, made for this thing is a code review checklist, right? And so this is the small one that I already showed, but here I have a little bit of a more a bigger one, right? And so if you go for authentication and user management, right, um, then uh, we see or authorization, right? We see that some of those we have to look through all of that um, and read it and understand what's going actually on. Um, but here with this website, I found it really nice because for this is code admin code stash bin.com, right? It shows us some information and this can be used as for the attacker to do it. Um, and then you you do this forgot password routine, right? And so um, you enter your, your email address, for example, right? And you reset a, a password and you see here the code actually, right? So one of the other things that happens here is that they have the email and they do like this to upper part, uh, which comes with another set of challenges. Um, I'm not going to, to spoil it for you, probably just try it out. Um, but yeah, I found it really cool. Um, I'm not going to show what happens here because uh, then I'm spoiling it. And uh, yeah, I, I think I, I'm i going to wrap up maybe a little bit. I We talked about we, scanners and everything, right? We so have a lot of question about asking uh, about your your code if you're willing to share that with um with the audience and about your slides uh okay. so if you okay, are yeah. um i'll take that from you and add that to the show notes so we mm -hmm. we're sure to uh to share that with everyone uh if you want uh because we're OWASP i have to <laughs> to share that we have a bunch of also vulnerable applications that are available that you can mm -hmm. uh, i think there's a project just for that that um uh, a vulnerable vulnerable application that you yeah. can go take a look uh the OWASP desktop pro project has pixie that was actually written okay. by by Nikki. Uh, so go ahead for that. And uh, a platform similar to, I'm not sure how similar it is, but that makes me think about Secure Code Warrior. We have Secure Flag. And if you're a member of OWASP, you have free access to Secure Flag. So uh, yeah, very this, cool. As well as yeah. uh, Secure Coding uh, Dojo. Anyways, take a look at, uh, go to OWASP.org, take a look at all the projects that are available. Uh, we have a bunch of vulnerable application and guidance towards that. Um, the general consensus is that we're, this should have been a lot longer than an hour. <laughs> they would want to go yeah, through yeah. all the code. <laughs> and yeah. uh, I know that you do some um, live streaming as well on your Twitch. I, it seems to be a, a topic of interest. So <laughs> if that's yeah, something yeah, that you want to take on, you should definitely do that because you'll have uh, people that will want to follow you on that. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll do, we have uh, the obligatory, uh, you know, round table, I'll go around. Um, Stefania, any feedback, anything you want to add before we, we wrap up? Sure. So that was awesome. You're very, very knowledgeable. And I really <laughs> learned a lot. And that was great. So thank you so much, Michaela. And also shout out to our audience for with the code reviews, like you were really helping us co host out. So mm -hmm. um, so yeah, and I really like the secure code warrior example, not because I work with them, but also it's a really good like interactive way. So yeah, really enjoyed the session. So thank you so much. I think Nikki had a question. Yeah, no, this was great. I mean, you, you've done like so much research just like in that why should we do this kind of area? And I think that's really, really important. I will just say that as somebody who experiences like this discussion a lot where what can we automate? What's manual? Why is it manual? Can we automate it? You know, there, there are just certain bug classes like, you know, uh, if you have an unprotected route or uh, an IDOR bug where a dynamic tool might find it and might highlight that it's there, but you'll never get that assurance unless you actually look in the code. So I feel like, you know, a code review process is like a really good sort of like, I don't want to say supplemental because it's not supplemental, but you know, when you use it in conjunction with all of the automated tools, you conquer a lot of ground. I think that that's how I feel at the end of the day about code reviews. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I think, I think I feel the same way. Yeah. 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 So thank you so much for, for giving us this whole, um, re all of your research and, you know, taking us through like a, a vulnerable app. Um, you know, it's always fun writing vulnerable software. I, 
I love yeah, that. Yeah, it was. It was very fun. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't know if I, you know, overdo it, but then it's not fun if you don't find anything. And I think it's nice to see, you know, um, even if it's, you know, very um, talent in your eye, right? Like where it's like, well, this is, I think it's good to, to see that and to say, well, I actually spotted, and there are so many other things like subtle things, right? You can go from this like low hanging fruit to much more subtle things in the application, right? Totally. Yeah. Um, Sienna, I'll leave you some last words. Do you have uh, any feedback? Yeah, I really enjoyed your talk that you had today and especially the, the studies that you've conducted and participated in showing how useful, and like Nikki said, how useful the 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 code review in conjunction with the automated tooling, how how much of the landscape you're like essentially you can you can cover. Um, and I'm really looking forward to uh, looking at the slides when they become available and checking out your channel. Yeah, cool. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. yeah. Awesome. I want to do, just before we, we leave, a, a slight plug for a friend of the show. Rana Khalil, who's a friend of the show, who's been on the show before, is starting her, her um, YouTube channel and she's starting a series, Web Security Academy series, um, next week. So I invite you, I'll put the link in the show notes uh, to take a look because I think she provides a lot of value and it's relevant to the topic that we discussed today. So if you enjoyed the, the code review session today, I'm pretty sure you you'll enjoy what she has to say. Um, so that was my plug for Rana. I hope she <laughs> she's not too mad at me or too <laughs> for plugging her. So that's all I had for today. Thank you so much, my, uh, Michaela. And everybody, we'll see you in two weeks. We have no show next week, but we have that, um, that CTF on the 20th, and we hope uh, you'll join us. So take care, everyone, and see you in two weeks. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone.